So yesterday, before the semi-finals between Real Madrid and Manchester City started, I was convinced that Manchester was going to win by two goals to one. I was so convinced that I was tempted to bet. But I said, how can I be preaching against sport betting and go and bet? So I didn't bet. So when the match began and Man City scored the first two goals, I said, Samikai. I said, this match there to end with 2-1 because definitely Real Madrid will score one. I mean, Benzema is there, so he has to score one. And then the goal came, and I said, my prediction has come true. So I was hoping that during the second half, there will be no goals, so that my prediction will be right. And contrary to that, we had even more goals in the second half than in the first half. So the match ended 4-3. Now, if I had gone ahead to bet, I would have lost. The other thing about betting is that you are so engaged in the game that it's almost like you are playing. And if you don't take care, you get hypertension. Imagine if I had bet yesterday and I was watching the second half. My hope would be that no goals, no goals, no goals. And when they are making an attempt to score, my heart would be racing. My dear friends, sport betting is evil. Those of you who have been betting, you are not only setting yourselves up to be poor in future, you are also killing yourselves. So please stop. There's nothing good in it. Last week or so, I read something online that there was a UG student who spent about 10,000 Ghana cities in sport betting, and he won only 200 Ghana cities. Throughout his time in Legon, he won 200 cities. Meanwhile, he had invested 10,000 Ghana cities. This thing we are talking about is serious. Don't wait till you become so addicted that you are tempted to use your fees to bet, because it is addictive. And that is why the church preaches against it. It is not just entertainment, it is addictive. And anything that is addictive, that you cannot control, but that which begins to control you is evil and will only destroy your life. So my dear students, be careful about sport betting. There is nothing good in it. This evening, my intention is to address some of the questions some of you asked by responding to the questionnaires that were sent round. Surprisingly, nobody asked about sport betting because you don't want to know the truth about it. I'm telling you that it is evil. So if you have been doing it, stop. If you have not been doing it, better for you. So one of the questions had to do with receiving communion on the tongue and the fact that during the COVID times when it was very severe, in fact, until recently, we were prevented from receiving communion on the tongue. And the person who asked the question 
was concerned whether we do not believe in God's omnipotence. In other words, won't God protect us if we should decide to take communion on the tongue, even if there is COVID? And my response to that is that the directive to take communion in the palm was as a result of a public health crisis. It has got nothing to do with faith. It's as a result of a public health crisis. And so the church, in her wisdom, directed her members, in order to be on the safer side, to take communion in the palm, to protect everybody. The person who is coming to receive Holy Communion, the priest who is distributing the Holy Communion, the person who is going to come after you. So it's not just you who is receiving Holy Communion. If you're having a private mass with a priest and you decide to take it on the tongue, that is well and good because it's just between you and the priest. But the person next to you, the person who will come after you and come after that other person, it's as a result of that that the church gave that directive. There is no need to tempt God. There is no need. There is no need to say that because you have faith, you are going to intentionally drink poison and you will not die. You will die and I will do your burial mass. And I will go and bury you at Awudome Cemetery. And the following day, Sunday, will come and do thanksgiving for you. You will die. You will die. God, who is the source of our faith, is also the source of wisdom. So if God has given us wisdom, he expects us to use it. And as a matter of fact, during the COVID times, I in particular, being your chaplain, I was concerned about those who could not take communion in the palm and preferred to take communion on the tongue. And I did something about it. Those of you who noticed, for such people, I'll meet them in the sacristy and after mass, give communion to them on the tongue. I'll take the necessary precaution, of course. I'll wash my hands afterwards. So it is not like the church doesn't believe in God's omnipotence, the church doesn't believe in God's power, and so the church is just following the direction of the world. No. When you find yourself in a public health crisis, you take wise decisions. Decisions that comes as a result of faith and also as a result of the wisdom that God has given to us. So that is uh, my response to that. There was a question also about the problem of evil in the world. When it comes to the problem of evil, for those of you who don't understand the problem of evil in the world, what it simply means is that how can a good God permit evil in the world? If he is not doing anything about it, then it means he's not all powerful as we think. And if it's all powerful and it's not doing anything about it, then it's not all loving. So that is the problem of evil. My response to the question of the problem of evil in the world is God's gift of free will to us. God has given each human being a gift which makes us like him. If the Bible says we've been created in the image and likeness of God, it is not simply a matter of our reflections look like God. No. Because you don't look like me and I don't look like you. So which of us looks like God? That is not the issue. When the Bible says we've been created in the image and likeness of God. God is free. And because of that, he created us free. So that is the unique thing about, about us human beings. We have the freedom to live the kind of life we want to live. We have the freedom to choose good. We also have the freedom to choose evil. God will prefer that we choose good and avoid evil. However, the power is in our hands. 
And so the way we choose to exercise our freedom is what brings about evil in the world. So it's a matter of choice, and it's a matter of free will. If even those of us who have gathered here in this church this evening decide that henceforth we are going to choose good and avoid evil, this university will be a better place. So the problem of evil, I believe, it doesn't question God's omnipotence and God's love. It rather questions our nature, who we are and who we choose to be at every point in time. Another response that I can give to the question of evil in the world is the parable of the wheat and the weeds in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, from verse 24. The owner or the farmer said that they should, the servant should allow both to grow together. And then on harvest day, the wheat will be separated from the weeds. So that is also something that scripture offers us to answer the problem of evil, the existence of evil in the world. God permits them, both evil and good, to dwell together. A time will come, the judgment day, when God will separate good from evil. Let us be on the side of good and we will be saved. Another question that came was, what do we do with torn rosaries, torn Bibles, and like religious articles that we are no longer using because they are old, because they are torn? My answer is, one, you can bury them. Don't throw them away. Don't just put them in the boiler. Bury them. If you don't have the means of burying them, give them to the priest. The priest knows what to do with them. So that is my answer to that particular question. There was another question on devotion to Mary. And usually, some of the people who pose questions about Mary, they pose the questions wrongly. And it is important that as a Catholic, you are able to identify that kind of situation. You should be able to point out the fact that the question in itself is wrong. And so if the person who is posing the question is not ready to correct the question, then you have no obligation to answer the person. For instance, if somebody asks you as a Catholic, why do you pray to Mary? The question is wrong. We don't pray to Mary. So the question in itself is wrong. Why do you pray through Mary? We don't pray through Mary. So the question is wrong. Now, the right question will be, why do you ask Mary to intercede for you? That is the right question. Because that is the relationship we have with her. We ask her to intercede for us. And the reason why we ask her to intercede for us is because Jesus has given her to us as our mother. And as children, you can always go to your mother if you need something. You can ask her to obtain it for you. So when you have devotion to Mary, what you are doing is that, number one, you have accepted her as your mother because that was the instruction Jesus gave on the cross when he was dying, the instruction he gave to the beloved disciple. So if you believe you are the beloved of God and you are Jesus' disciple, Jesus has given Mary to you as a mother and you to her as a son. That is the relationship we have with her. If other Christians choose not to respond to that section of the gospel, that is their decision. Don't forget, we started talking about the problem of choice. So it's up to them. But I will encourage you as a Catholic to be completely devoted to her because she's your mother and she's my mother. Because she's the mother of Jesus Christ. Again, we are inspired by her intercessory role at the wedding at Cana in John chapter 2. We are inspired by that to ask her to intercede for us because she is concerned about our welfare. She is concerned about our needs. As Catholics, we pray to God through his son, Jesus Christ. So that is what we do. 
So if somebody tells you that, why do you pray to Mary? Tell the person, your question is wrong. We pray to God. Why do you pray through Mary? We don't pray through Mary. Your question is wrong. We pray through Jesus Christ. And if the mass ever serving with me will be kind enough to bring me the missile, I'll point out something to you. Even when we are celebrating Marian feast, pay attention to the prayers of the church. The prayers of the church are addressed to God through his son, Jesus Christ. Even when we are celebrating Marian feast, if there should be an occasion that we should pray to Mary, it should be when we are celebrating a Marian feast. And if there's an occasion that we should pray through Mary, it should be when we are celebrating a Marian feast. So let me just give you an example. What are some of the feasts of Mary? Assumption, what date is that? It's what date? Where are the children of Mary? Okay, so let me take a feast like a solemnity like the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception is celebrated on December 8th. And listen to the opening prayer for Mass. This is a, a typical Marian feast where Mary is honored in the celebration of Holy Mass. Listen, opening prayer. Oh God, we didn't say oh Mary. It's oh God, who by the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin prepared a worthy dwelling for your son, grant, we pray, that as you preserved her from every stain by virtue of the death of your son, which you foresaw, so through her intercession, we too may be cleansed and admitted to your presence. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. This is the opening prayer to the Father through the Son. During the Feast of Mary. So, we get it right. And sometimes, yes, I know that there are some devotees of the Blessed Virgin Mary who take it a little too far. I've been in parishes where the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary, if it had been a little lower, they would put a cloth around her. They would put a cloth around her. And I always tell them to remove it because it is not a naked statue. Unlike this one, this is a naked statue. So if you have any cloth, put it on this one. Put it on Jesus. Jesus is naked on the cross. The statue of Mary is not a naked statue. So some devotees of the Blessed Virgin Mary, yes, take it too far, but don't confuse that with the official position of the church. The official position of the church is that Mary is a model to us. She's an example of holiness. She's an example of somebody who gives her life completely and entirely to God in service. And also, because she's our mother, we, we can ask her to intercede for us. If you say the Hail Holy Queen, if you say the Hail Mary, if you say the Memorare, you are invoking her, you are asking her to pray for you. In all these prayers, pay attention to the words of the prayers. You may be acknowledging a Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with you. Of course, these are the words of God himself because these were the words spoken by the angel. Who is an angel? Is simply a messenger. A messenger does not speak his own words. A messenger speaks the words of the one who sent him. So when Gabriel came to Mary and said, Hail full of grace, the Lord is with you, he was only repeating God's words to her. So these are God's words himself. And when you repeat it, when you are saying the Holy Rosary and you are saying it, you are acknowledging who she is. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Why is she the Mother of God? She's the Mother of Jesus Christ, who is God. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. That is what you say. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. 
So don't let anybody who is not Catholic confuse you. Or don't let another person who may be Catholic but may not be too convinced about his or her faith confuse you either. From today, if somebody asks you the question, why do you pray through Mary? Tell the person, we don't pray through Mary. Your question is wrong. Ask another question. If the person says, okay, why do you pray to Mary? We don't pray to Mary. We pray to God. So your question is wrong. So please take note of it. And let us be devoted to her because she is our mother. She is our mother. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, how can you not have a relationship with his mother? I mean, think about it twice. Think about it twice. How can you, for instance, like me as a priest, William Abe Kwapri, and yet despise my mother who gave birth to me? If I see any act of disrespect towards my mother from you, the relationship between me and you, it ends. Because I love my mother. And I don't think Jesus, who taught us to love, will not love his mother. So let us be careful about those who speak against her. They may be speaking in their own condemnation, but they may not be aware. So let us be careful, especially those of us who are tempted to following them. Another question that came had to do with images in the church. My response is, does the Bible tell us not to make images? No. The question or the issue in the Ten Commandments where God instructed his people not to make images, it was within a particular contest where they were making images to represent God. So don't be confused. God permitted images to be made. But those images that he permitted to be made in Scripture did not represent him. When he asked the, uh, Moses to make the cherub to sit on the Ark of the Covenant, wasn't it an image of an angel? It wasn't an image of God. But it was an image all the same. And God asked Moses to do it. When God asked Moses to erect the bronze serpent, wasn't that an image? So when people question you like that, Point to them in scripture where God himself allowed images to be made. Show it to them right there in the Bible. The temple that Solomon built, it was filled with images. The temple that Solomon built. Why do we have images in our church today? It is because they remind us of who they represent. The image of St. Joseph reminds us of who St. Joseph is. The image of the Blessed Virgin Mary reminds us of who the Blessed Virgin Mary is. The image of Jesus Christ on the cross reminds us of how our salvation was won. So my dear brothers and sisters, these images are important. And in churches, they bring our minds to the kind of place we have entered into. When you enter a church, they help to communicate to you where you are. You are not just in any space. You are not just in an auditorium. You are in a sacred space. And they help to communicate that to you when you enter the church. There's a, a joke, I should say, about the crucifix. Maybe some of you have heard it before. About a little boy who was not doing well in school until he was brought into a Catholic school. And his results improved drastically. And so when his father asked him, how come we have taken you to all kinds of schools you've not been doing well, but when we brought you to a Catholic school, your results have started improving. He said, when I entered the classroom, I saw a man on the cross, and I knew that this place, they don't joke. If I don't perform, they will put me on the cross like they have put that man on the cross. So that image in the classroom communicated to that small boy, even though that was not the intention. The intention is not to threaten anybody to good behavior. But that little boy was inspired by what he saw on the cross to improve upon his results by studying hard. How do you know that the other images that we have in the church have not contributed to somebody's salvation in the 2,000 years history of the church. How do you know? 
How do you know? You want somebody who started his church two years ago or five years ago to tell you who are a member of a church that is over 2,000 years ago that you can't put image in your church. When did he come? When did he come? Does he even know the history of churches and how churches are built? Today, if you go to some of the uh, earliest charismatic churches, you find all kinds of, if you go to Action Chapel, don't you see the image of a praying hand just in front of the church? What is that praying hand doing there? Are they worshipping it? The image of the praying hand that is sitting in front of Action Church, are they worshipping it? If you go to Utabel's church, there is a painting behind his sanctuary. What is that painting there for? Is he worshipping it? It's a huge painting from wall to wall. What is it there for? Gradually, they will come to know why images, why paintings, why these things are important in a place of worship. Gradually. They are young. Be patient with them. They will grow. If you are, if you are, if you are, you are a piglet, you, you, you wonder why your, your, mother, your mother's mouth is so long. Because you are piglets, your mouth is smooth. And you are questioning your mother. Mommy, why is your, and your mother will tell you, wait, you grow. There are certain things you learn when you grow. When you are young, you won't get it. So please, when it comes to images in the church, remember, God does not forbid it. He doesn't. So there's nothing wrong with having these images in the church. Another response is God is spirit. How does he manifest himself to us? Through fire. Is fire not an image? Through earthquakes. God manifests himself to us in ways that we can understand and comprehend. If God is to manifest himself to us the way he is, in his nature, we won't understand. Even the resurrection, we are still struggling to understand it. The resurrection... Because it is something that had never happened before. It has never happened before. So the apostles were struggling to comprehend it. What does it mean? The, his reason, when Jesus told the apostles before his death that he would die and on the third day he will rise, they thought he was speaking in parables. Do you remember the question they asked? They questioned among themselves what rising from the dead could mean. What could it mean? He said you will rise from the dead. What could it mean? Because it is unheard of. For somebody to die and to rise and die no more. So the mysteries of God are communicated to us through our senses, through what we can see, through what we can hear, because that is how he created us. If God is to communicate himself to us the way he is, we will die. That is why the people of the Old Testament who say, God, don't show yourself to us, otherwise we will die. And so God will use material elements, fire, earthquake, wind, to communicate to them. Because the nature of God is not something we can comprehend. So if we have these images and statues with us, they are to help us to appreciate a little of the mystery of who God is. So please cherish them. And if you don't have a small crucifix in your home, get one. If you don't have a picture of the Blessed Virgin Mary in your home, get one. And don't be bothered about those who tell you, how do you know this is a picture of Jesus? It is not a picture of Judas. It is not a picture of Judas. So don't, don't, don't mind them. They have nothing to say. That is why they will they will attack you by saying, how do you know it's Mary's picture? She has revealed herself to people and they have painted her as a result of that. The divine mercy, which we celebrated last Sunday, Jesus revealed himself to Sister Faustina and instructed her that they should paint him. And the way he appeared to her, that is how she made sure they painted him. So don't let anybody confuse you. Another question that came was why we read our prayers in the church. 
I believe it's a question of uniformity. There are thousands of Catholic churches in the world. If priests were allowed to say their own prayers, you'd be hearing things. So I believe in the wisdom of the church, these prayers are being composed to ensure uniformity and some kind of standard. So, but at the same time that the church has these written prayers, the church also encourages spontaneity, or the church encourages us to pray on our own. When we are celebrating Mass, and after the bidding prayers, the priest says, present your personal intentions in a moment of silence. That is the time to say your own prayer. But we are encouraged to say it in silence so that your prayer doesn't distract another person. For those of us who are used to spontaneous prayers and vocal prayers in groups, sometimes the prayer somebody is saying can distract you. It's the truth. It's the truth. Imagine if your goat is missing and the person standing next to you is praying that, God, forgive me for the goat I stole yesterday behind this house. And you know that your goat got missing yesterday at this precise, precisely this place. Do you think you can concentrate on your prayer? When somebody is confessing to chopping a stray goat. So, please realize that all these forms of prayers are present in the church during our worship. And also, when you are having your own personal time, your own personal devotion, your own family prayer, you pray without um, having to read any prayers. You, the father of the house will pray, the mother of the house will pray. The children are even encouraged to say their own prayers. So that, that, is, that is it. As far as this intercessions book is concerned, we got it because sometimes those who are selected to come and lead us in the, in the bidding prayers, they don't seem to know what to do. So I am hoping that all this time that we have been saying the bidding prayers from this book, we are listening. We are listening. So that one day, join us if I call you out of the blue, come and lead us during bidding prayers, you will not come and stand here and fumble. Because you have been listening. And if you know why we pray the way we do, first of all, we pray for the church, then we pray for the country, the world, then we pray for those of us who have gathered for the worship, we pray for those in need, and then finally, we pray for the dead. That is the order. Why that order? Because we are praying as a family. It is not our individual prayer. It is the prayer of the church. And in praying for the church, the needs of all must be remembered. Another question that came had to do with having completed catechism. Maybe you've done your confirmation, so you are done. How do you continue to learn about the faith? If you wish to join an ongoing catechism class, well and good. The catechists will not sack you. The catechists will not say that you have already done your confirmation, so get out. No. You just want to revise. It's allowed. You can sit in. And then on your own, you can also read. There are several books that have been published as far as the faith of the church is concerned. In fact, there is no church that has more books than the Catholic church. There is no church. You can put all the other churches in the world together. Their publications will not be up to the publications of the Catholic Church. If you can't find any Catholic book to read, you have not searched enough. You have not searched enough. A few times, some of you will come to my office and you ask for a book or two to go and read. But the vast majority, they, 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 they don't mind. They, are, they want to read something else. There are books which will help you to appreciate the Catholic faith. They are there. You go to the Catholic Book Center at Abraka, there are books there. If you go online, these days you can download the PDF versions of several books, several books, Catholic books, authored by the popes, the bishops, some priests, some sisters, some brothers, and even some lay faithful, very good books, which will help you to appreciate your faith. So these are ways that are available. There was a question about what a childless couple should do. A childless couple that is seeking to have a child through the normal means 
and it's not being successful, can adapt. It is, adoption is a way of having children. It, it is very uh, common in some parts of the world, even though the process can be cumbersome, but it is still possible. So please remember that one day, if you marry and through no fault of yours, you are not having children, don't kill yourself. You can adopt. I know couples who have adopted children. They are living with them as a family. Some of them, their children even don't know that they were adopted. I'm sure when they grow, they will tell them. But there is nothing wrong with being adopted. There are very successful people in society who were adopted. And they were brought up by other people who were not their biological parents. So that is my response to that. Communion under both species. It is not um, the usual practice to take communion under both species because there is the need to preserve the sacredness of what we are receiving and avoid any form of spillage or contamination. This notwithstanding, it is important for us to understand that whether you receive only the body of Christ or only the blood of Christ or both the body and blood of Christ, it is Christ you are receiving. So it is important to understand that so that it doesn't matter whether you are giving just the body of Christ or you are giving just the blood of Christ or you are giving both. What is important is you are receiving Christ. And it is not part of Christ that you are receiving. You are receiving him body, blood, soul, and divinity. That is the faith of the church. That is the faith with which the church gives you communion. And that is why the church expects a response. And I keep saying this all the time. Why will you come before the priest and he says the body of Christ and you are looking at him? You don't respond. Some of you don't even respond loud enough. It, 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 for me, it says a lot. Is it like you are not convinced about what you are going to receive? And your, sometimes your response is just to nod your head. We didn't ask you to do that. We say respond. Open your lips and respond. So it is important that we understand what we are receiving. And so long as we understand that, there should be no problem about um, not receiving communion under both species. It is the recommended form according to the laws of the church. However, practically, it is not easy to accomplish. And that is why the bishops across the world, not just in this country, across the world, always recommend to receive communion under the body of Christ. There was also a question about calling priests fathers. It's, it's a very old question that keeps coming up. And I believe those who ask the question are challenged by Jesus telling his disciples not to call any man on earth their father. Of course, Jesus was talking about something else altogether. If you read, why do I say that? If you read from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul calls himself a father. Is he equating himself to God? He's not equating himself to God. This is what he says. Even if you should have countless guides to Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ through the gospel. That is how he describes himself to the Corinthians. He is their father. Is he the one who gave birth to them? No. Is he the one who created them? No. He is their father because of the gospel of Jesus Christ which he preached to them. And so that is, that is why you call a priest a father. Because of that. You don't call him a father because he gave birth to you or because he created you. When you are calling God father, and you are calling me standing here, Father, there's a clear difference in your mind what you are talking about. You are not confused. And so why do you let a non Catholic confuse you? When you are praying and you say, God, our Father, or when you are saying the Lord's Prayer and say, Our Father, you know exactly whom you are calling. You are not calling Father Beku. He is not the subject of your our Father. He is not. So you know. You know what it is. But sometimes... 
you allow people who don't understand you to detect to you. And that is where all the confusion starts. So please, you know what it is. So be convinced about that. There was a question about, if you are tired, let me know because I'm answering all the questions. So if you are tired, if you want to go and watch the second half of the uh, Champions League between Liverpool and uh, what's the other team? Yeah, some of you are even following it on your phone. Be careful, you are in church. So if you are tired, just wave your hand. If I see that many people are waving their hand and I know you are tired, then I'll stop because we have about 20 questions more to go. Should I continue? Okay, so they are saying yes, so we'll continue. There was a question about the veneration of the cross. I believe the person was referring to Good Friday when we came to venerate the cross. We venerate the cross for a simple reason. It represents Jesus Christ who died on a day like that, on a Friday at 3 p.m., somewhere in the world, on a mountain, outside of Jerusalem, outside the city, for our salvation. So we want to remember, we want to relive that experience. And so we come together on Good Friday to do that veneration, to acknowledge the source of our salvation, the cross and the resurrection. So that is the simple reason for which we, we, venerate, we venerate the cross. It's a sign of reverence and gratitude. It's a sign of reverence and gratitude. There was a question about reincarnation. Please know that Catholics don't believe in reincarnation. Catholics don't believe in reincarnation. Sometimes those who believe in reincarnation, they want to quote the Bible to justify it. Please, they can quote 100 quotations to justify reincarnation. Quote only one. After death, judgment. That is all. Quote only one. After death, judgment. Let them quote 1,000. It doesn't matter. Quote one. After death, judgment. Don't think that you can do what you like in this world and then you die and then you, you come back again as a goat so that somebody will eat you and then you enter heaven. You will not enter heaven. You have only one chance. You have only one chance. After death, judgment. If you have any good to do, do it now. Do it now because I believe the teaching of reincarnation is satanic. Why? It is a way of getting a lot of souls because if I tell you that this life is not your only life, when you die and you don't achieve perfection, you will come back again. Why will you struggle to do, like to make sacrifices, to discipline yourself, to do, you, you have another life. So if this life doesn't work, come on, you, there's another life. There's no other life. It is Satan deceiving you. You will not have another life. Either sometimes they believe that if you were, you were rich in the former life and you didn't achieve perfection, you come back in another life as a poor person so that that poverty will, make, will help you to achieve perfection. You will not. After death? After death what? You. So when they quote 100, just quote one. After death, judgment. Keep repeating it. After death, judgment. After death, judgment. They will be tired, they will go. Someone was asking a question about the Blessed Sacrament that was taken out on Holy Thursday and brought to this section of the church for us to come in groups to pray. It is to mimic what happened 
the night before Jesus died, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember when he was in the garden, he told his disciples, come and pray with me. Come and watch with me. And what were they doing? They were sleeping. God, they were tired. They were tired. But that was the time Jesus needed them. So we tried to relive that experience. So since we believe that the communion is Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, we carry it in procession, and then we come in tents, not to, not to sleep behind or beside him, but to pray in his presence. So it is to commemorate what happened at Gethsemane. There was a question about speaking in tongues. It is a topic we can treat later, but my quick response to that is, it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is not a, a skill to be learned. Okay? It is not, you can't, I can't bring you to the church and teach you to speak in tongues. I can't do that. It's a gift. You only ask the Holy Spirit. If you want that gift, you have to ask the Holy Spirit for it. You have to ask the Holy Spirit for it. So that is uh, what I would say about it. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And those who have that gift should freely exercise it. Why not? But remember, whenever the Holy Spirit gives somebody the gift of speaking in tongues, the Holy Spirit also gives to another person within the same community the gift to interpret it. So they go together, the gift of speaking in tongues and then the gift of interpretation of tongues. And then there's another gift which is praying in tongues. That is entirely different. If you are praying in tongues and you are speaking in tongues, they are completely different. Because normally... Speaking in tongues is a message. It's like preaching. It's like me preaching to you at this moment. I'm speaking English. But if the Holy Spirit chooses to give me the gift of speaking in tongues, as I speak English, you will all understand me in your native language. Instantly, all of you. If you're a Ghan, you think I'm speaking Ghan. If you're a Fanti, you think I'm speaking Fanti. If you're ever, you think I'm speaking ever. That is the gift of speaking in tongues. It is not common. It is not common that I'm speaking one language and then everybody who is gathered to listen to me is able to understand me in their own language. It's not like, I'm not saying you understand me in English. Oh, that is not what I'm saying. That is not tongues. If you understand me in English, I'm not speaking in tongues. I will only be speaking in tongues when you can understand me in your own language. So, there's a lot to learn about that. But for now, this is what um, I will say. Maybe next uh, semester, we can take it as a topic and deal with it um, entirely. There was a question about the Lord's Prayer. That in the Catholic Church, we don't say all. When I hear those things, they're my heart. We rather, we, we don't say all. We who taught them how to say the Lord's Prayer, we, we don't say all. Okay. It's okay. It's, it's not a problem. So, if you read from, the, the Lord's Prayer comes to us in the Gospels, in two Gospels, in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 11, two following. And then in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9 following. It is the version of Matthew that we often use. Now, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. It's not part of the Lord's Prayer. It is not part of the Lord's Prayer. It was an addition that came about during the course of history. It is not part. So if you look at some of the old Bible translations that were done, you realize that that particular, those words are put in italics. They are put in italics. The original Lord's Prayer, they are not there. Just compare the Lord's Prayer from Matthew's Gospel to that of Luke, and you realize what it is. 
So if they have decided to add something to it, they shouldn't present it as if that is what Jesus taught. At least we can say when Jesus was teaching, we were there because Peter is our first pope. They can't say that. Peter is our first pope. So we can say authoritatively that when Jesus was teaching his disciples the Lord's Prayer, we were there in the person of Peter. So if we say this is what Jesus taught, we have reasons to say that. So please keep some of these things in mind. You can go back and check Matthew chapter 6 from 9 following, Luke chapter 11 verse 2 following. Look at the two and then draw your own conclusion. There was a question about fasting, fasting in Easter. In Easter we don't fast. We don't fast as a church. But if you want to fast as a person, fine. Yes, I don't encourage people to fast on Sundays because every Sunday, whether we are in Lent, whether we are in Christmas, whether we are in Easter, every Sunday celebrates the resurrection and it's a day of joy. It's a day of joy. And according to the Bible, you don't fast on joyful days. You don't fast on joyful days. So please remember that. If you want to fast as a person, go ahead. But even as a person, don't fast on Sundays. It, it makes me think you don't even appreciate the mystery of the resurrection. If Jesus has died and has risen for you, what is your problem? What, is, what, what at all is doing you that you have to fast on Sunday? What? That you can't be joyful one day. So please, let us be joyful people. Christians are joyful people. There was a question about why the prayers in the church are short. Like the opening prayer, short. Prayer over the gift, short. Closing prayer, short. Bidding prayer, short, 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 short. My answer is, a good prayer doesn't necessarily have to be long. It is not because the prayer is long, it is good. Or it is effective. What did Jesus Christ himself say? Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. In praying, listen, in praying, do not babble like the pagans who think that they will be heard because of their many words. This is what Jesus said, though. This is what Jesus said. If you know what you're asking for, you will keep it short and sweet, straight to the point. Remember the thief on the cross? What, what was his prayer? Remember me in paradise. That is all. He went to heaven. How many words? Remember me in paradise. Four words. He went to heaven. If you are inspired to say a long prayer when you are having your personal prayer, it is good. Why not? Why not? There were times when Jesus would pray the whole night. So if you are inspired to do that, why not? But don't think that because the prayer is long, it is efficient or it is effective. It doesn't mean that. Prayer must be addressed to God through his son Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Finish. Whether it is long or short, it doesn't matter. It must be addressed to God the Father through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. That should characterize our prayer. There was a question about dating and going for communion. There's nothing wrong with it. So long as we are not fornicating. So long as we are not fornicating, there's nothing wrong with dating and going for communion. And that reminds me, the ladies among you who don't go for communion because you are menstruating, I don't know who taught you that. It is not Catholic teaching. If you are menstruating, in fact, that is even when you need more communion because you need the blood of Christ. 
You need the blood of Christ. Your blood is reducing, so you need the blood of Christ to top up. So even, even that is the time you should even go for communion. I'm, I'm not kidding, I'm serious. So I don't know who has been teaching you. I don't know that you, you, are, you are menstruating, so you can't go for communion. Who said that? Who said that? Who taught, which Catholic priest taught you that? Give me his name. That when you are menstruating, you can't go for communion. It is only when you have sinned that you can't go for communion. Menstruation is not a sin. Why? Because God created it. Anything that God has created is not evil. Or you think as a woman, you chose to menstruate. Me, if I were a woman, I would never menstruate. Ah, that painful thing. No, 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 no. I won't, I won't do it. I, maybe that's why God made me a man. Because I, I don't think I can endure it. My sister has cramps, her last born. She's a girl, she has cramps. And when, when she's about to menstruate and she, she's lying in bed, you think she's going to die. We just have to be praying for her, give her painkillers, two, three days, then she's fine. Then she's jumping all over the place as if she was not the one who was lying down. She was dying some few days ago. And you want me to go through that? And then you are not going for communion because somebody told you you are unclean. The person who told you you are unclean, you should be careful because he is describing what God has created as unclean. Don't be confused about some of the things that were said in the Old Testament. Earlier on, I talked about public health crisis. When you are in public health crisis situation, Certain directives are given which are not contrary to the faith. Some of the things, the injunctions and the laws in the Old Testament were as a result of health situations. They didn't have menstrual parts in those days. And so when you were bleeding, when you were menstruating in those days, you had to sit at home. You had to stay at one place. They didn't have panties. Forgive me to say that in church. They didn't have panties and boxer shorts and supporter and those things. They didn't have those things in, in the Old Testament. That is why even in the Old Testament, they will say that a woman must not ascend the sanctuary. A woman. Because in ascending the sanctuary, you expose yourself. Because they didn't have supporter. They, they were not wearing drawers in those days. So you expose yourself in ascending the sanctuary. So when you are reading the Bible, please... Read it with the mind of the church. You will never get it wrong. If you want to follow these people who learn the Bible six months and they are out as pastors, you will be confused because they themselves are confused. There was a question about uh, the difference between priests and religious brothers. The simple answer is that ordination. Ordination sets them apart. Priests are ordained to exercise certain ministries in the church. Brothers are not ordained. Brothers usually have professions. So maybe a brother may be a doctor, a medical doctor, that is his profession. A brother may be a carpenter, that is his profession. So brothers are like that, but they also take the same vows of poverty, chastity, obedience. But what set them apart is the ordination. The ordination, the fact that priests are ordained to perform sacred, sacred duties. So that is it. There was a question about baptism. There was a question about baptism. Why we don't practice baptism by immersion? Again, like the question about the devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, the question is in itself wrong. Because if you go to some parts of the world, in some Catholic parishes, they do baptism by immersion. So the question is wrong. If somebody says, why don't you do baptism by immersion? The question is wrong. There are three forms of baptism in the Catholic Church. Baptism by immersion, baptism by pouring, baptism by sprinkling. What is important, what is to be remembered as far as baptism is concerned, is that water should be used. 
and the Trinitarian formula should be invoked. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That is it. Baptism by pouring is not a modern thing. It's not something new. Right there in, in the time of Scripture, baptism was done by pouring. It's just that there was no need to explain because those who were receiving or those who were writing the letters and compiling their books and those things, they knew what baptism was. They didn't foresee this kind of controversy. Otherwise, they would have described it. Let me give you an, an example of baptism by pouring. There were people who were baptized in prisons. Do they have swimming pool, swimming pool in prison so that they'll go and immerse them in the water? How were they baptizing people in prison? How were they doing it? Not by immersion. It would definitely be by pouring. St. Paul himself, how was he baptized? Read the account of St. Paul's baptism. Acts chapter 9. Verse 18 following. Read it very well. You realize that St. Paul was baptized by pouring. By pouring. Right there in the home where he was. That is where he was baptized. So read the account very well. And pay attention as you read it. You realize that. Those who were baptized in prison, you will find some in Acts chapter 16, verse 33. So baptism by pouring is a form of baptism. Baptism by immersion is another form. Baptism by sprinkling is another form. Three forms of baptism in the Catholic Church. There was a question, but I'll be very quick with it because I think that the person um, is, is not... Maybe the person didn't get the contest very well. The person was concerned about the hymns that were singing during collection time. It is only in Lent that we do that. And even that one is only in Legon. I keep telling the choir masters this all the time. Me and my two parishes as a priest from Nima to Teshi, before I came here, we were never singing hymns during collection. It's Legon. It's Legon. It's here. You know that from your parishes, they don't do that. So why are you even asking that question? Because your parish where you came from, they don't sing hymns during collection. Huh. So if you are asking a question and it doesn't reflect what you know, probably it is something peculiar to Legon. It is not universal. It is not Catholic. So that you are worried about it. Uh -huh. It is Legon. Me, I don't know where it started from or how it came about. Me, I don't have a problem with it, honestly. But if, if uh, they don't sing the hymns to, fine. But we are finished Lent, so don't try, don't try that move. Don't try that move today. And then when you give the opportunity to hearts of worship to also sing, then they are also singing hymns. <laughs> because we are in Lent. The choir has been singing hymns, so we too will sing hymns. You don't even know the history. You are copying. I hope today you are not going to sing hymns. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let me leave it for next week. Or oh. the, the, the liturgical committee. What activity do we have for next week? If there's no activity, then we'll continue the questions. So those who, are, who still have questions and they've not asked yet, follow the link, send your questions, let's add them to the nine remaining, and then next week I'll respond to them. So let's be quiet for a moment and um, reflect on the mystery of our faith, the fact that our faith is a gift from God, and when we have something from God, we can only cherish it. We can only cherish it. We can only give thanks for whatever comes from God. So let us reflect on our faith and give thanks for that. After a minute, we'll take the intercessions. <laughs> 